We uh, also have good news for you. Uh, you saw that today we, we took up an offering after an, a, a most excellent story uh, about girls and tools uh, taught by their fathers. Uh, I have a girl too, and uh, uh, she gave me in advance of Father's Day because uh, my family is uh, not with me right now. Uh, she gave me a little book and it had numbers of sayings in it like, uh, I appreciate that you, and then there's a blank and you're allowed to write in there whatever you want. And she said, I appreciate that you taught me how to take care of my car. Uh, and now that she is very much on her own and she is taking care of her car, it, it was amazing that most of those little thank yous in that book had to do with her car and <laughs> tools and changing a tire. So I, I'm feeling like your dad did a great job and, and if he did a great job, then, then I must have done a great job too because that's, uh, that's what you think about. When you're a dad, you think about wanting to make sure that your kids are safe, that your family is safe. It's, it's kind of this thing I believe that God has built into to dads and men, not to say that he hasn't built it into women, because I, I do believe that, that one of the names of God, which if you want to research this later you can, is El Shaddai, which is a feminine term and refers to what a hen will do when she gathers her chicks. And uh, in fact, the story is told of that chicken that was in the, the barn fire and she died, but her chickens survived because they were underneath her where she protected them with her life. So that attitude of wanting to protect, wanting to raise is definitely something that we are grateful for in, in dads that exhibit that. And even those who don't fear God look at dads who run away as shirking their duty. The tabloids are always full of things that I find most hilarious because most of these things are written by people who don't care about God, yet they are very interested when people do things that God told them not to. It's strange, but that's the world in which we live today. We we today are looking at dads and grads, and so I needed to mix that with where we are in our journey with Elisha. And I'm going to tell you that it wasn't easy, but God came through, let me tell you. God came through. And it starts for me with the fact that what we're celebrating today is the completion of a journey. Education is a journey, whether you're graduating from sixth grade, my sister, or whether you are getting a big mortarboard and, and, a, and a thick uh, uh, jacket with lots of velvet on it. Did yours have lots of velvet? Yes, yes, okay. And, and you're getting a PhD. Now you're going to be a uh, a leader of the sixth grade class or going into the seventh grade class or you're going to be a leader of leaders. It's a journey. There's a completion of that journey. Schooling has happened. Mentoring has happened. Uh, and now you are graduating. Um, we are pleased to have in the, uh, the, the paper uh, Jennifer Heinrich's exuberance Good, she's not here, so she can't be too embarrassed. One of the Clar Santa Clarita papers has her in great exuberance on her graduation day, and it just kind of captured that feeling of what it, what it feels like to finish after you have slaved night after night, after you have given it your all, and you have been, you have been given that piece of paper, some call it a uh, sheepskin, maybe it was on vellum in times past, but you've been given this piece of paper that says you're done, you're, you're finished. Well, 
I'm going to call on Jason Hinkle at this moment and say that once again, he has completed and he is a dad. And we're very proud, very proud of you, man. Yeah. And uh, even though your wife did all the cooking, <laughs> that little bun was born on your time schedule last Sabbath. Uh, they decided if you don't come, we're, we're just going to take you out because <laughs> we want to see you now. And so uh, we have a, a new Hinkle. Uh, however, it is Zachary that is important in the uh, man-focused Arabic-speaking part of the world. And so your name now is no longer Jason, it's Abu Zak. <laughs> because as fathers, you are then named after your firstborn son, and you are forever afterwards known as the father of your firstborn son. So he is now known as Abu Zak, or father of father of Zach. So Joshua will just have to just be Joshua and, and he'll know that when he has a son that he can become that. Yes. Okay. So you get the idea. But that what happens is that that you you become a leader too when when you have children and the graduation part of that is that that you are now qualified to be this this person in in the next part of your life. Um, uh, graduation means that you now know something and that knowing something you're going to put that knowledge to use and you're going to contribute to the greater society and hopefully you will be paid for it. I've told my, I've told my daughter uh, when she was in high school we, we didn't press her to get you know a lot of extra jobs or anything like that, even though she was going to an expensive Adventist school, we said to her, look, you get good grades, somebody else will pay you for them later. So to all you students out there who are sub-college, uh, uh, just know that that is still true today. and. Uh, I believe the state of California can be rather generous at times for those who show due diligence and, uh, and, and can help. And we certainly as a church also want you to know that we are proud when you put forth your greatest effort and we would like to see you duly rewarded for that. When you become a father, you also graduate. You graduate from not being a father. And the fact is, you can never go back. 3 a.m. and she nudges you, it's your turn to feed. You can never go back to not being a, a not dad. And there are those who have thought about that, maybe a little more than those of us who didn't. And they've decided, oh, you know, maybe I want to wait on that. Because you can't give it back. We also don't think about this very much when we think about graduating. We, we're so proud, and we are proud. We're proud to be graduating from 12th grade. We're very proud. We've, we've accomplished. But the fact is, now you have a knowledge base. You have, you, 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 you have expectations that are upon you and you can never go back. Those responsibilities sometimes weigh heavy on us because we, we have a desire to not be responsible. Dads are, 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 are always looking out for ways in which they can be responsible. I know that. I'm going to assume that all dads here today in the hearing of my voice are very happy to be responsible. Aren't you glad that our Heavenly Father also feels those responsibilities and that, in fact, He thought about it a lot and made sure that if anything went wrong, He had a plan of salvation.
I believe that that's a father who put some thought into what might happen. He didn't have any idea that, well, he was hoping that it wouldn't happen, but it did. And so he sent Jesus to save us, to be our brother, to give us a way to know how to get home to our Heavenly Father. We never, we never graduate from being a dad. And uh, Jason probably is, can attest to that the most at this moment. Um, but I, I, will, I will see your wife at some time in the future, and I will thank her for uh, being the great mother of three now. The fact is that in our story, that we have been following Elisha for the last several weeks, and we could say that graduation is also like the mantle being passed. You have Elijah going up into heaven, the fiery whirlwind, and he drops the mantle down and it falls on the ground, and Elisha decides to pick it up. So, yes, uh, Brother Wizard, your mother has thrown down the mantle, and you're going to go off to college, and you're going to pick it up. That's a decision. That's a decision that we make when we're young. We don't often think about it, but our parents want us. They want us to pick up what they have dropped for us. Let me give you some examples of what they want you to pick up. Brush your teeth. Eat your greens. Do your homework. Choose your friends wisely. Remember curfew at 11. I moved out of the house because of that. Because my younger brothers still had to live there and they had curfew at 11 and I didn't think that that should be for a college person. Be courteous. Say please and thank you. Have a firm handshake. Look him in the eye. Drive the speed limit. Yes, yes, that was a piece of wisdom my father gave to me. Be sure your sins will find you out. I hated that one. Thanks, Mom. How about this one that I have picked up from other fathers and other readings? Love wins over hate. Pieces of wisdom, pieces of wisdom that dads and moms pass down to their children and that they themselves have gotten from their parents and they have also then gotten from God. When you become a dad, you never graduate from that. Now you are responsible to pass that on, to pass on the mantle. Elijah's mantle uh, falls from the whirlwind. Elisha picks it up and he wraps it and he smites the waters, and the waters part for him as well. He calls upon the God of Elijah. He graduates. It's now up to him. He goes to Jericho. He's called upon to go to Jericho, as we learned last week, and he follows the inspiration, he follows the wisdom from the Spirit, and he throws salt into the spring from a new bowl. And you just have to get the video to find out what we said about that last week. And what happened was that sweetness ensued. And the Bible says that it was sweet forever after that. But today we, we see Elisha leaving Jericho. He's leaving Jericho. He's, he's continuing on what could be thought of as his first maiden voyage, his first journey that he's going on now as a recognized prophet, as a recognized confidant of God and his power. He's on his way to Bethel. 
So cue the big movie music, Brett, please. Uh, you know, this is the moment, the swell of the music. You see him leaving Jericho now. He's on his way to Bethel, and it's dark music. It's dun-dun-dun. Because the, the music is going to set the scene now for the fact that he is actually going to confront the current religious situation in Israel. He is going to Bethel. Beit El. The house of God. But you see, it's a long time since Jacob it's a long time since he lay down there to sleep on the run from Esau and put his head on a stone and then was given a vision by God of angels going up and down a stairway at the top of which was Jesus. He knew him then as Yahweh and he is there communicating with him and he says to him, even Though you are in this situation, I will be with you. If you ever need to find grace in the Old Testament, this is one of the stories. You tried it your way, Jacob. You listened to your mother. You tried it your way. You deceived your father and then made your brother angry. I was going to work it out for you, Jacob, but you went your own way. You did your own thing but I'm going to be with you anyway, and I'm going to bless you. He wakes up, he wakes up that next day, and, and, and he realizes that, that he has been in the presence of God, and so he declares, he, he anoints this stone which he turns up. Have you read uh, or sung that song, Here I Raise My Ebenezer? Well, now you know. That's a name for that stone that he turns up. It's a, it's a marker stone. And there he anoints it with oil, just like a king would be anointed, like Samuel anointed David. He marks the spot. Surely this is the gateway to heaven. This is the house of God. This is, this is, this is where Elisha is going. But you see, during the days of Elijah and Elisha, you have someone called Ahab and then his son uh, who had been following in their father's footsteps, Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Don't you love biblical names? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think Joshua is going to be thankful that you chose such a, such a good one. Uh, you know, Jeroboam, son of Jason, just, I don't know, doesn't go. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, do your research, my friends. Turn to 1 Kings 12, verse 28 on your phones, in your Bibles, or the one pew Bible in front of you, and you will see something that happened at Bethel that sets the scene for this situation that only gets one tiny little verse in the Bible. You see Elisha going from Jericho to Bethel. But he is literally going into the heart of the cult of Baal. Because you see, for political reasons, for, for economic reasons, for his own reasons, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had taken a golden calf, remember where that happened last time, and he put one in Bethel, and he put another in Dan. Dan was another town. It also represented one of the tribes. He did this because Israel, the ten tribes, had separated from Judah and Benjamin. And they had decided to have separate systems. And the capital for Israel would be Samaria. And their place of worship would be Bethel. And he thought to himself, if I don't do this, then they're all going to go down to Jerusalem. And, and, and they're going to, to then go back to the other king, Rehoboam, son of David, son of Saul. So... That's why I'm saying, for political and economic reasons, which is what I'm divining from 1 Kings 12, 28, he puts a golden calf 
at Bethel. And he initiates the worship of this golden calf by choosing uh, priests of whom, whomever he liked and choosing festivals, the Bible says in verse 33, whatever he liked. So this, this place now, instead of becoming, instead of being what it was originally, has, has been repositioned, it's been repurposed. It's, it's no longer the house of the God of Jacob. It has now become the place of worship of the God Baal or Baal, the sun god. Now, we don't have time today to, to go into more detail, but I, I do want you to study, I would love to encourage you to study the comparison between this story and, and what you would find in Revelation when it talks about the setting up of thrones and kingdoms and the changing of times and seasons if you are at all interested in that kind of study, this is a, a beginning. This is, this is a, a thing that the Bible calls a sin. A breaking of the relationship. I was with Jacob. I met Jacob at Bethel. He reminded everyone that would come afterwards that this was the house of God, the living God who brought people out of Egypt and Jeroboam, son of Nebat, has the audacity to set up the worship of Baal at the very same place and then tell the people, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. Blasphemy. Absolute, plain, straight up blasphemy. So ever afterwards, anything that happened like this is referred back to the fact that it is the sin of Jeroboam. And every king that comes afterwards now is judged as to whether or not he followed in his father's footsteps or did right in the eyes of the Lord. Just read Kings and you'll find that there are some who did and some who didn't. A key phrase, though, in this that I want you to grab a hold of, dads, grads, and everyone, is that he did all that was of his own choosing. This was not what God had intended. This was not the God to be worshipped that Jacob had met there. So Ahab and his son, this is now 2 Kings 2 and 3, Joram had continued in this blasphemy and this rebellion that Jeroboam had started. So in this one tiny little verse that, that you read there in the story of Elisha, he leaves Jericho, this cursed city that cost the builder, the rebuilder of Jericho, his firstborn and his lastborn son, as Joshua had cursed the city, so the curse came true. He leaves that cursed city and he goes to the very heart of this cultic religion known as, as Baal worship. It is very fitting, very apropos that he is jeered. Yes, the boys come out. They come out from Bethel because they are going to now defend what they like to do. They, they want to make sure that this guy who is a Johnny-come-lately, who has been following after Elijah, who has now gone up in a whirlwind, they want to come out and tell him, you're not so cool after all. And they call him names and they call into question his authority. That is what is behind the idea of bald head. You do not have the authority here. You are not part of this situation. But woe to anyone who gets in the way of one of God's cubs. Woe to you if you get in the way. He will send his bears. He will send his bears. And there are those of us, I can tell you, who can tell stories of those bears. And how God has sent his angels in various forms to protect and to bless and to, 
to be on the road with, in the journey, on, in the stream of consciousness, as it were. And 42. I, I don't know why it's 42. My wife says, oh, it's six times seven. Well, yes. 42 of those young men are mauled. We're not knowing whether or not uh, they are killed, but they are mauled. They, they leave with the scratches and the bites of a bear. They'll think twice about jeering the man who represents the living God again. Next up, Carmel. That's why I have in the, in the title, this is, a, this is a progression of cities. It's a, it's a journey. Graduates have just finished a, a journey and now they're going on. Dads have, have, have become dads and they're in a journey of being a dad. Elisha is journeying and the next stop is Carmel. The circle I see is now being closed. Elijah. Elijah starts the circle. He is the one who calls the people to meet him there at Carmel. And the fire fell on his sacrifice. There was also some running away. Do you remember that part? He ran in front of the chariot of Ahab all the way back to Jezreel. And then he ran into the wilderness. But he came back. He came back and, and, and he passed the mantle. And, and, and Elisha, here we see him making his first journey. And he heads right for the same spot where God showed himself to the people. Remember, the whole country is worshipping Baal. Well, except the 7,000 that... God said had not bowed the knee, told Elijah that, Elijah that in the wilderness. But he heads to that very visible demonstration spot that Carmel now represents in the midst of a world, as it were, in the midst of a country that has chosen to be in rebellion, has chosen to be in blasphemy against God, he heads to the very spot where all of that was proven false because the fire fell on Elijah's altar. He wants to be near where that fell. Dads, grads, all of us, whoever you are now, you are in a journey and you're becoming something. I, I want to appeal to you today to let Elisha's journey be your journey today. There's several things you have to do if you want that to be the case though. First of all, you have to pick up the mantle. God has, has given you parents, he's given you a church, he's given you a situation, he's given you life. You have to choose to pick up what he lays down. I say that we should, like Elisha, we should call upon the God of Elijah and say, where are you, God? I want you in my life. I want your power in my life. You want to take this same journey that Elisha took from Jericho to Bethel to Carmel, then first and foremost, you have to pick up the mantle. You have to pick up what God is laying down. Say, say yes, number two. Say yes to the call for help from those who are dying in this world. It's kind of how I see Jericho. Again, we talked about this last week. They still live under a curse. We, we still live in the valley of the shadow of death, do we not? We live in a, in a cursed world. And there are people crying out all around us saying, help, 
help. I don't know, don't know where I'm going. I, I'm blind. I need to be able to see in this dark, dark world. If you have accepted the mantle, my friends, that gives you the ability to say, I'm over here, kind of like Marco Polo. I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to lead you to the light. It's what Elisha did when he said yes to the people of Jericho and he took a new bowl and he took the salt and he threw it just like Jesus said, you will be the salt of the earth. He took the salt and he put it in the bad waters and the bad waters were made whole and sweet again so too will be the lives of those that you listen to and that you throw yourself with the power of God motivating you, throwing yourself into their lives. Number three, I say that we should head for the house of God. Make sure that your direction in your journey, like with Elisha on his first journey, is that you are headed to being part of the house of God. Because you see, house has to do with family. House has to do with inclusion. That's why we call people uh, of the, you know, we call them husbands, house bands. They're the ones that bind the house together. Head for the house of God. Be, be on call with the one who has called you by his name. We'll talk about that more another time, but I want you to know that the name of Jesus Christ is the name by which all humanity is saved into the house of God. It's a family name. Just a quick piece. Third commandment says, quick test. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. For the Lord will not hold you guiltless. Interesting little piece we don't often add on there. You take my name, you get married to me, you are part of my household. What you do reflects on me. And what I do reflects on you. So God has never let us down. Have you thought about how many times last week, I know I'm thinking about it, that I let him down. And that what I did did not reflect well on the house of God. But you know what? He invites us anyway. He says, I don't care where you are, Jacob. I don't care that you just lied to your dad. I don't care that you just, you just took away what your brother thought was his, but which had been prophesied would be yours and you did it your own way. I'm still going to be with you. Amen. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't know if I deserve that kind of grace. Head for the, head for the house of God. Become part of his family. Be, be proud. Be proud that you are part of the family of God. Number, th number four, uh, like Elisha, I, I, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be where the fire fell. What do you say? So the next thing he does, he, he leaves the, the house of God and he goes to the place where God has demonstrated his power. We don't need to feel weak. We don't need to feel powerless. Head for the place where we last saw God's power in, in your life. And I know that each one of us can give a testimony like that. Head, head, head for the place where God showed his power like he went to Carmel. Well, you know, as we've said today, you can never not be a dad once you're a dad. You can never not be a grad once you've graduated. My question today is why would you ever want to walk away from God once you know him? You see, the difference between maybe some of us and, and some others today is simply that they've never known him. 
And so Elisha's journey shows us that we too can be part of those people who go to individuals and go to this world and help them to know God. So that like Elisha, we, we feel his power, we participate in his power, and we, we, we share that with other people who are wandering around in this world of darkness. So I say, may we all look to our Heavenly Father, the everlasting I Am, the, the life giver, the Prince of Peace, the King of the universe. May we look to our Papa. Amen. Amen.